apparently optically fantastic, so I want to try the best optics behind the best optics to see how it works underwater. And then the bug eye, the um, EMWL1, is attached at the moment to a D850 and a 105 lens. So you, you can, on a dive, okay. um, swing this one in, okay. shoot bug eye pictures. But I'll go right in onto the camera. Change the shoot bug eye pictures, and then shoot standard macro. And then, if you want, slide in a a, a, um, a you know a normal macro, super macro lens like an SMZ1. I've got on here. Cool. So it's, it's a, but I, I'm not a big fan of that super flexibility. I'd rather get my gear optimized for one shot and go after that shot rather than constantly. Change. So we're going live. You ready? Yeah, yeah. We're okay. Ready. Are we live? Mm, no, not. I don't. Not right away. Are you a diver and you maybe even take photos or videos underwater? Then this live stream is for you. Because we believe that everyone who takes images underwater is already an ocean ambassador. And to make sure that you can do your job properly and inspire people out there to care for the ocean and eventually protect it, we collected your questions beforehand on social media. And we're going to ask those questions to creative professionals from the industry. And we are sending live from the world's largest water sports show here in Düsseldorf, the boat show, which is taking place from 18th to 26th of January. You want to find us live in Hall 11 at the Pixel World workshop stage. Make sure you follow us on social media, on the Behind the Mask Facebook page and on the Behind the Mask YouTube channel. Turn on your notifications and most importantly, ask your questions down in the comments and maybe we will even be able to pick up your question and forward your question to our guest. And one more thing, by leaving us a comment, you already have a chance you got to win me? amazing prizes. Yeah. Okay. All right, and here we are with one of our, I would say, super special guests. He is at the moment in the Cayman Islands. Alex, how are you? <laughs> what are I'm you doing in the well. Cayman Islands? Uh, yes, it's, it's a nice place to do an interview. I'm actually sad that I've, I've never been able to make it to the, the boat show. Um, this window every year is, is a time of year when I always run underwater photography workshops. I have done every year for the last 15 years. And as a result, never been able to make it um, over there to join you guys. So I'm super excited actually to be able to join by video link today. I, I think one question that we always get is like, how did you actually get into uh, underwater photography? It seems like it was so long ago. You know, how was it back then? <laughs> yes, I had hair and, and everything. Um, I think um, the first thing that I would say is actually, for me, it's been a lifelong passion. And actually, I took my first pictures underwater as a kid. I never imagined it was to be a career. I always wanted to be a marine scientist. Um, but I think the idea I had of a marine scientist was probably more similar to the job I do now than what happened when I, I trained in, and, and worked as a marine biologist for many years. Um, and then in my late 20s, having worked as a marine scientist for well, nearly eight years as, as both a PhD student and as a postdoc, um, I then decided to give underwater photography a go as a career. And since I was 29, I've been doing that every day ever since. It's not always been financially very rewarding, but it's been incredibly emotionally opportunity rewarding and I think I have much better opportunity to share my passion for the ocean as an image maker than I, than I did as a scientist. And I can reach a huge number of people and hopefully change their impressions and their opinions about the seas. And you do the same thing right there in the Cayman Islands now because you have like guests with you and you're doing a workshop? Yeah, the workshop starts tonight at 7 p.m. local time here. So I've got a little bit of free time to test a bit of camera gear. I was talking about it in the preamble. Um, today, I'm actually going to do most of the testing in the swimming pool and then maybe go out to a reef this afternoon. Um, and then my workshop kicks off at 7 p.m. tonight. So, yeah, I've got two weeks of workshops. So 14 photographers joining me this week and then another 14 next week. Sounds great. I mean, we're all a bit jealous because this is the middle of winter. You know, nobody really knows how the world's largest, you know, water sports event can take place in a place without water in the middle of winter. But it's working. There's a lot of people here. Everybody's interested in following and seeing a little bit of your work. I thought... Um, I was in Europe yesterday, so yes, I'm, I'm enjoying the sun as well. Uh, you're from the UK, so you know bad weather yeah. pretty well. Okay. Yes. Um, I think what we would like to do is actually, we would like to see some of your 
photographs. We've been asking you to send us your some of your photographs that you that are special to you and they have like kind of a little bit of a backstory, so we can learn a little bit about either technical things or whatever challenges you you had. And on the other hand, we also would like to ask you a few questions that we collected from the community because we never get an opportunity like this, you know, to ask someone like you, just maybe to you, maybe some very simple real life uh, questions. But this is the questions that the people have out there, you know, they want to evolve and get better in what they're doing. So, yeah, I I'm really happy. I'm, um, I, I sent you some photos, all of which I've taken during the last 12 months. So hopefully they're pictures that maybe people haven't seen lots of times. It's nice to share new work, but I'm much more interested in answering the questions. Um, I think it's really the best, you know, the best use of this forum. So, and also a big thank you to everyone who did send questions in. It's really fun to be able to answer them in, a, in like this. Okay, cool. So everybody who is watching, guys, don't hesitate, don't be shy. Just po uh, post your question uh, in the comments. Same here. If everybody's following on uh, the live stream, uh, it's on Facebook on the Behind the Mask Facebook page and on our YouTube page. And then Hamdan is here. He's always hiding a little bit. You know, he's very shy. But he's the guy uh, following everything going online and maybe throwing in another question here and there. OK, so let's start. I mean, it's, you know, this is, this is great. Look at this first photograph. Can, you, can we get the photograph on the side? Yeah. Oh. You remember taking this? Yeah, well, yes, all the pictures are from the last 12 months, so if I don't remember them, I've got some problems. Uh -huh. um, but actually, I think this is a picture that I will, I put this picture in really because it's what, it, more than being a, a photo that I, I love, it is an experience that will stay with me forever. This was photographing blue whales in the Indian Ocean, um, way offshore from, from Sri Lanka, and we were doing that under government permits to allow us to take the, the images and be in the water with the whales. Um, but this picture, you know, after days and days of, of trying to get encounters, this was just one of those lucky moments where we found a whale that was kind of resting in the, on the surface, um, just having seemed to be not moving very fast, and we were, I was able to go in off the boat. And this is the only time I've sort of been below a, a blue whale. Usually you go in the water, you see a whale, and it's kind of cruising below you, or the same level as you. And this time we, we went in off the boat, free dive down, I looked up, and there it was above me. And, and this is obviously taken with a fisheye lens. So it was a whale, water wall whale. And I was looking up at it, and it was the difference between being on the surface and looking down at one and being underwater staring up. It was just incredible. So I, I love the picture because it takes me back to that moment that I, I saw. Um, I think with the, and, and that's what's special for me. So if that's a fisheye lens, how far have you been away from, from the whale? I, I don't know, because I was looking through the lens. So, but. I guess not, I mean, probably five, six meters. It probably maybe, maybe, maybe a little bit more. I, um, but yeah, not, not super close, you know, you're not, you're not, uh, you know, most underwater photography is done in, within touching distance, but the big animal photography is the exception to that. There is an, a, a question I always wanted to ask you. Like, if you shoot something like this and you talk about the emotional moment that you have and that it, that, like, the picture means to you, how much does the camera actually take away from being in that moment? Um, it, it definitely does. It's a barrier between you and the experience. But I think when your goal, my goal in going in the water is to create those pictures and share that passion. So my passion is, is having those, um, is creating those images. And I think as a photographer, more than any of the tech, technical aspects that we'll probably talk about in the questions, you have to shoot with your passion. If you photograph what you are passionate about, and whether it's the ocean, whether it's particular species in the ocean, you will always create pictures that people will want to look at. Because if you put all your passion into your photos, you'll create those special images and other people will want to look at them. If you shoot without passion and you just think, oh, this might win me a competition, this might do this, this might do this, it, it, the pictures won't have that, that soul, that, that, you know, they won't have that thing. So whenever I'm shooting a subject, I'm thinking, what do I think is amazing about this moment, this subject, this place? And I try and pour all of that into my, my picture. And whether it's a, a huge blue whale or whether it's a tiny in Nudibranch, I try and be as enthusiastic and as passionate about the subject I'm shooting at the time. And I think that brings out my best photographic instincts and allows me to create the best work I can. It definitely works. As oh, far nice. as we're concerned here, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally works. Okay, first question from Carlos. Is it possible to try long exposure with wide angle and underwater photography? 
goodness. Um, we're, we're starting with, 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 with good technical stuff. So absolutely, I think the best thing you can always do as a photographer is to experiment and push the boundaries. Um, actually, uh, in underwater photography, in the old days when we shot on slide film, our film was so slow that nearly all wide angle shooting was quite long exposure for, for the backgrounds. And then when digital came along and the ISOs have crept up, people have kind of forgotten that you can shoot really slow underwater. So first of all, when you shoot with flash guns, strobes underwater, you have the ability to shoot long exposures and still have a lot of sharpness in your picture because the strobe light freezes the, 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 the areas that it lights up. And then you can allow movement and blur and long exposures to come into the background. So it's relatively easy with a normal camera rig to shoot relatively long exposures, have plenty of sharpness in your picture, but also a movement and a feeling of movement where you don't want that by using a long exposure. To get technical, the magic number in terms of camera settings to get into the interesting realm of creating blur and motion is slower than one fifteenth of a second. So the numbers that I usually use for these types of pictures are a fifteenth, a thirteenth, a tenth, an eighth, and a quarter of a second. That sort of range is slow enough to create lots of interesting movement and blur without being so long an exposure that you end up with a big mess and it's very uncontrollable. So those are sort of the magic numbers. Um, and there's different techniques within that. If you really want to experiment with really creative techniques, you can use even longer exposures, but then you're getting into the rounds of wanting to use tripods and things underwater. And that, I think, is very underexplored in still photography. Um, and there's a real frontier there. But I've taken some well-known pictures using that technique of putting a tripod down, particularly at night when the light levels are lower, and playing around with the very interesting shapes and movements that you can get in a, in a very long exposure. But the typical technique is handheld with flash guns, flash to freeze what you want to be sharp, and then camera movement or long exposure to create interesting blur over that exposure of, say, a fifteenth down to a quarter of a second. So let's have a look at, the, uh, at a photo that could be done with this kind of technique. I'm not 100% okay. sure, yeah. but uh, yeah. Tony, can we see that one? Oh uh, yeah, so this is yeah this is a, a macro um, rather than a wide angle long exposure, and this picture here is is taken um, with a snooted flash to illuminate the goby, and then a long exposure just moving the camera to create texture. Um, and I just felt with all that fine texture of the C pen that actually moving the camera would create an interesting effect with that, uh, and then was hunting around looking for a subject within it to to light with the snoot. So the snooted light freezes the, mo the subject where the light hits it. Because it's only lighting a small part of the frame, only a small part of the frame is sharp, and then the rest of the picture is, is pleasingly blurred. So sn snoot means, for everyone who is not familiar with the term, do you have one there? I, I do, but it's inside. Um, but it's, yeah, it, it's basically, um, I'll just lift up a strobe so you can see. I've got loads of camera gear here. So instead of having a normal diffuser on the front, you, you take that off your strobe, and you put some sort of beam restrictor on. Some of them have lenses in to make them more powerful. And what it does is it, it narrows the angle of the strobe light down so that you can create anything from a very tiny spot up to a bigger scene. And, and it can be used creatively in a lot of photography. Also, when diving in murky water, we tend to use very small beam restrictors that stop our light spreading everywhere and help reduce backscatter. So there's kind of two types of snoop we use underwater. One is that creates a very small spotlight. Um, and you can vary the size of that spotlight. And the other one is a very small snoot that just narrows the angle of the strobe beam down and helps control backscatter in, in, in more turbid water. Man, that's a lot of information. Yeah. That's amazing. It's been recorded so you can watch it back. <laughs> Maybe we'll ride with this one. Maybe this one has a long exposure wide angle thing going on. Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. So oh, yeah. So this is again. I think um, so. This is a picture of, of big eyes um, in in the Maldives, and my this picture here is I've zoomed the lens during the exposure. So it's a long exposure. I don't know the camera settings of this without looking them up, but I would bet it's something like a tenth or a thirteenth of a second, right in that sweet spot that I was talking about earlier. And then what I've done is I've taken the picture. The flash has gone off and frozen the fish. And then I've zoomed the lens during the picture just to create this sort of ghostly effect. I, I shot these fish as well, lots of standard shots. But then I was looking to create something a little bit different with them. I had a nice friendly group of fish hanging out with me. And it was a good chance to experiment and create sort of a more graphic, interesting image. 
And pictures like this that are slightly more intriguing can maybe draw someone in and make them want to find out more. So they're, they're valuable pictures to take as a photographer. Is that something that is like, um, like you, you play around with it in the afternoon for a while and then something comes out of it? Or is it like you go there, you, sh you know what you want, you shoot it and then it's there? Yeah, I mean, you know, techniques like this, I, I, you know, I've been shooting them for, for, you know, for, for decades of time. But you're never, I think the fun of those techniques is, is that you play with them as a photographer. You know, I never, you know, I, I take my photography seriously, but I, um, I think it's really important to experiment and play as a photographer and allow yourself to discover things. I think that keeps it fresh and exciting. So it's always interesting to play with these techniques and see what they're coming out. So I didn't go in the water necessarily planning to try that shot. I obviously went in with a zoom lens, not all my lenses are zoom lens, but you need a zoom lens to be able to trip to me and make a shot like that. And then um, found a friendly group of fish and thought, oh, I've got some good standard shots. What can I do to make something different? I see. OK, cool. The, the, the next one we have seems to be about camera movement but also long exposure? Yeah, this is a very similar technical shot to the Gobi shot. So a macro shot with the subject frozen in snoot light and then the camera moved um, to create a feeling of blur. In this case here, it was a little bit more of a problem solving choice of technique. This was a very nice painted frogfish um, in the Philippines, but it was living in a really ugly place. And so rather than show all that ugliness, I started off shooting it with a snoot and just lighting its face, and that was nice with a, a nice face on a black background. But I felt that was just a little bit dull, so then decided to then lengthen my exposure, allow some ambient light in, and then just move the camera to just basically hide the ugliness of the background. And I think, for me anyway, I've turned what was an ugly background into quite a pretty scene. Absolutely. Amazing. Another question we have. Eden is asking, could you talk a bit about techniques for lighting large racks for wide-angle shots? Okay, um, yes. Um, I think the first thing I would say about the wreck photography is to appreciate what it is in a picture of a wreck that's really going to reach out and grab the attention of someone looking at your photos. And for me, the most dramatic wreck shots are the ones that look like how a child would draw a shipwreck or, you know, um, um, an example that always springs to my mind is the, the Tintin book or Tantan book with the, there's like a, you know, a wooden galleon under the, under the, under the ocean. Um, and that's kind of how people imagine shipwrecks look. So when we can capture that sort of feeling in our wreck photography, I think our pictures sort of chime with people. They, they resonate with the audience. So, and generally that means shooting as big a scene as possible. You know, if you go down to a shipwreck and just photograph a, a winch or an anchor or a porthole, it's nice. But it, it's not the same as trying to shoot as big a picture as possible. That big scene of a ship sitting on the bottom of the ocean is what, for me, is, is, is really pleasing. So such a big shot is actually pretty much impossible to light up with strobes. So I think the first thing I would say about trying to light up a wreck is ask the question, do I really need to? And I think the majority of wreck shots don't need to be lit. So first of all, think about turning your strobes off. Now, if there's a particular feature on the wreck that you want to illuminate, or there's particularly colorful subject matter on the wreck, you might then want to introduce strobes if there's nice soft coral growing on it, a school of fish growing on it, that can look really good. Alternatively, um, you can give a light source to a buddy, and I think one of the classic ways to shoot a shipwreck is to shoot the shipwreck in completely ambient light, so it's just there in the natural light, and then the light source is being provided by the diver in the picture. So you maybe have a, have a diver holding a big video light or something like that lighting up the wreck. Um, as you get more interested in, in, in wreck photography, I think some of the most interesting wreck photography being done at the moment is done using artificial light, where, di where photographers are going down specifically to shoot wrecks and actually spending a big proportion of their dive setting up lighting around the wreck to light up the features that are interesting, are, in, of, of, are of interest. And that allows them to create I think very atmospheric pictures, but also pictures that show a lot of interesting detail and draw your eye around the frame. Um, on deeper wrecks, this is easier to do with, with continuous lights, so big video lights, because you can see exactly what the light is doing. But if you're in shallow tropical water and you've got bright tropical sun like I've got here, those lights tend not to be powerful enough. So then you need to use remote strobes to do the same job. And then it's a case of you go down, you set your lighting up, you light up, set it up where you want to light up features of interest and then you're able to, to go down and take your picture and shoot your scene. Um, so quite advanced techniques, 
but I think they're really transforming wreck photography. And I think, for me, if I had to say which area of underwater photography is most exciting at the moment, I wouldn't say any of the sort of current fashions like black water or um, I'd say wreck photography is actually the most exciting frontier at the moment because the there's more and more people diving deeper and finding wrecks incredibly intact, interesting wrecks in the sort of 30 to 100 meter range. And they're not just going down there and photographing them, they're using the high ISO capabilities of cameras, combining them with big video lights that are now available and really creating astounding pictures that just weren't around even five years ago. And I think that's a really exciting area for underwater photography. I think we don't have the 100% matching photo for that, but I think we have one oh. that is showing a, oh, sorry, showing a little bit what yeah. you were talking ah, about, yeah, right? Yep. Yeah, so this is, yeah, so this is a, a motorbike, a British Second World War motorbike on the wreck on the Thistlegorm in Egypt. Um, this is a picture I took this summer. And all, all the pictures are from 2019, last summer. So, um, and here I've placed flash guns behind the, the motorbike in order to create this interesting backlighting effect. It's a, a photo I've done before, and I, I did this picture on a workshop um, to, uh, as part of the teaching of the workshop. And then I was just fortunate that when I'd set this picture up, the lionfish swam right across the top of the motorbike. And I, I, I got one shot when it was in the right place. Um, it's not quite looking at the camera, but you know, I was pretty happy to get a lionfish in the is shot. That, is that continuous light or is it a flash? I, I, it's easier to do that shot with continuous light. It's easier to set the light up because you can see exactly where the light is and get the beams looking right. The problem with that is it needs to be dark to do it with continuous light. So I think I did that one with flash guns and it's much harder to set up with flash guns. So if anyone wants to do that shot, the best thing to do is dive for this at night and do it with, talk with big powerful video lights. But if you know exactly how to position the strobes, you can do it with strobes as well. But it's, it's a lot harder with strobes because to get those beams to look like that, you have to have the strobe in exactly the right position, um, which is you basically have to have the strobe the really, really well hidden behind the, the, the wheel of the bike and then close enough so that the strobe creates beams through the spokes of the wheel. So it's, it's quite fiddly to set up. Cool, another question. What's the best way to judge balancing your strobe power with ambient light to correctly light your subject, but have a correctly exposed background to give depth to the image at the same time? Okay, um, another, another good question. Um, I, I think this photographer knows what they're looking to do because I think they're, they're talking in all the right ways in that most wide angle photography and stills photography is about getting a good balance of light between your strobe lights, which are lighting up the color and detail in your foreground, and then letting that balance well with the ambient light in the background, and then using what you can see in the background of your picture to create a pleasing frame with a feeling of depth. In the same way that behind me, the, the, the palm trees and things off over there um, are creating a nice feeling of depth in the picture. You need elements in the background. Underwater photography is not just about finding a, a great foreground subject and blasting it against blue water. You need to find that foreground subject and build a picture around it to create a, an interesting scene. So in terms of getting that right technically, the first thing I would say in photography is it's, it's an art form. And your picture, if it looks right, it is right. So it's up to you what you want to create. But yeah, that, that previous picture was a good example of balancing foreground. That picture just flashed up on the screen about balancing um, foreground lighting and background lighting. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a, um, a pleasing quality of light in my foreground as well as the right exposure. So I'm adjusting my strobe powers to get the right exposure on the foreground, but I'm also getting the positioning of those strobes exactly right so that I get a smooth, even illumination over my subjects on the foreground. So you can see all the color and detail in them without them feeling are too artificially lit. What I want is the viewer just to enjoy my picture and not go, oh, he's lit all that up with flash. Of course, nearly every picture I take is lit up with flash. But if I use the flash subtly and I use the flash in, to create smooth, even lighting, I think it feels much more naturalistic underwater and it balances much better in terms of the quality of light with the background. And that's just as important as getting the quantity of right light correct in terms of the exposure. So you're adjusting the strobe powers to get your foreground lighting right and your shutter speed to adjust the background lighting until they're both the same. 
but it's, it's really about the, the nuances of getting those strobe positions exactly right to get the pleasing, soft, even illumination from the strobes in the foreground. I think we have a good picture for that. Um, not maybe, yeah. well, I mean, kind of, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is a, a less controllable situation. The fish are all moving around. There's lots of, lots of variables in motion here. Um, the, the manta ray wasn't going to, you know, sit in that position for ages. And I have to, on this dive, the visibility was about five meters. So it was real pea soup. So hard to pull a picture together in those conditions. This is, again, in the Maldives. Um, is that one of the photos that you send us, or is this one of the photos that we were dragging out of your amazing archive on your website? No, this is, this is also from last year, so probably one of the ones I sent in. So if you've got an archive picture, it won't be from last year, I suspect. So um, ah, okay. I think this, these are all from last, the last 12 months. Let's check out this one. Cool. No, that was taken on the same Maldives trip. Um, this is a, a school of paddle tail snappers. Um, paddle tail snappers often school tightly like this, but anyone who's an underwater photographer knows that this species is often very uncooperative. Um, you know, they, they look great at a distance, and then when you try and get close to them, um, places like the Maldives and French Polynesia are great destinations to shoot them. There's lots of them there, um, but they, yeah, they, they tend to be quite a timid fish. Make these tight balls, but then when you get into photographic range. So on this occasion, I knew that this. To make a strong picture of this, it was all about the shape of that school. But I also knew if I tried to get too close to it, I'd probably, the school would break up, it would split in two directions, it would make a bad shape. So I, I purposely stayed at a little bit of a distance and shot it from a distance. So pushed my strobes out really wide so they didn't create back, too much backscatter and, and basically set up to shoot from a distance. And I was using the, the predecessor of this, or not the predecessor, the other version. So this is the WACP2. And that, that previous picture was taken with the WATP1, which is another another of the wide angle lenses. Oh, that's heavy. So the, the strobes are super far out. Do they yes. actually do they actually really have an effect on that distance? Um, my big strobes do. Yes, I was. Um, yes. So yeah. Um, and yeah, you, I think uh, certainly from what I can see on the screen, you can see the strobe light hitting the, the fish. Um, and and you know, as long as you can get some light on there, a little bit of white balance. And it's, it, they're going to they're going to look nice, but it's important to get them out nice and wide. And actually, sometimes on these very long camera to sort of distance photos, I'll even take the diffusers off to help the light throw a long way. But my, my normal strobes are, are these I'm just, are these big um, C cam ones. Um, this is my camera here, um, and so they've got a lot of power. And what I'll do if I'm trying to do a shot like that is I'll just flick my diffusers off. They're on a piece of string, so they just hang down next to the thing. And then I'll shoot those shots, and then when I finish, put them back on for normal shooting again. And like, by wide apart from each other, you mean like super wide? Is it like like really super wide apart from like yeah, the flash? Yeah, because it's all yeah, it's it's all about that camera to subject distance. When you're a long way away from your subject, your strobes need to go out, you know, all the way out. Otherwise, you're just going to light backscatter. You know, by the time you reach the subject, which might be a meter or a meter and a half, two meters away. You know, you're going to light it nice and evenly. But if you leave your strobes out wide and you try and photograph something close to the camera, you'll get a very horrible quality of light. So that's when you need to pull the strobes in close. So the majority of underwater photography is taken very close to the subject. So most of the time, your strobes are actually quite close in. And this, the previous photo, was uh, an example where they're not close in and they're out wide. And, and schooling fish, for me, they're a subject that it's all about the shape of the school. You want to keep that shape together. And the, the subject that, for me, breaks the golden rule of underwater photography. And the, the golden rule of underwater photography is get close, then get closer. But with schooling fish, they're actually, you've got to unlearn that rule and say, you know what, I'm going to get a better shot if I don't go too close. And I keep my distance, keep the school in a nice formation, because it's the formation that makes the picture strong. And uh, just for anybody who doesn't know what backscatter is, the particles between you and the object that should not be lit by your flash because they will reflect basically the light and destroy a little bit of the picture quality. Is yes. That, so it's basically like a, like a triangle that the, the flashlight will meet in front of the uh, object that you actually want to photograph? Yes, um, but it's actually, I think, best if you don't just think of it as a triangle, think of it as a cone. And then you see how that cone just gets bigger and bigger the further out from the camera it goes. 
And the best way to reduce backscatter in underwater photography is, is, is not to do with stroke positioning. Stroke positioning is important. It's about getting close. If you get close to a subject, you won't get much backscatter because the volume of that cone is massively reduced when you get close. So okay. you know, the, you know, the best advice, you know, you know, it probably might even be one of the questions, you know, how do I get less backscatter? Just get close. And okay. when you have poor visibility, you can't shoot pictures from far away underwater. You have to accept there are certain days underwater when you can't shoot, you know, a massive great scene. You need to work on close focus stuff because that's all the conditions are allowing. And then when you get nice clear water, then you can go, right, now I can shoot a lovely big scene, which I can't do every day. Okay. Flo, just to add to that, we're actually getting a lot of questions. Um, Alex, we're actually getting quite a bit of questions regarding the visibility, as you just mentioned. If you had general yes. tips for people in terms of what to do when visibility is compromised or if the water conditions are just not as favorable as all your amazing pictures are showing, what would you tell people? Um, I would say, first of all, um, underwater photography is always about, you know, being realistic about what's technically achievable. And some days, you know, you go out and you've maybe got your camera equipment is not optimized for the opportunities you get, and you have to accept that you're not going to get yeah. that shot. Um, so it's always best to play to the strengths you've got. So if I go in the water with a particular camera system, I'll try and take the best possible pictures I can take with that camera system, rather than looking around going, oh, I wish I could shoot that, I wish I could shoot that, and end up wasting my dive on wishes that I could never do. Of course. So, um, and it's the same with visibility. If you have poor visibility, it doesn't mean you can't take great underwater photos, you're just limited on the types of shots you can take. And, you know, the big rule about bad visibility is it's all about close, close focus. So whether you're doing macro, you could do lots of macro and super macro in bad visibility. You can do wide angle in bad visibility, but you're limited to close focus wide angle. And it's about, you know, narrowing your options down based on the conditions. You know, it's sunny here today. If it was a cloudy day, I wouldn't go out and try and shoot beautiful, big, bright reef scenics that need sun. I, I would wait till the conditions come to me. So it's, you know, as a photographer, you can't control everything, but you can control yourself to play to what the conditions allow. Yeah, cool. Excellent. Anything else? Yeah, we're, do you have any advice for over-under shots? Um, yes, um, the first thing is find the right conditions. I think people often try and force them when the conditions are not right. The second thing is find the right subject matter. And people always want to know about the technical side and how not to get droplets. But the, the main reason most underovers fail is people don't find good subject matter both underwater and above the water yeah. that are going to work in shot. People might have, you know, oh yeah, this subject came right to the surface, so I did an underover, and then it's just a plain blue sky or something boring. You need to find really, you know, good subject matter. But for example, in the Red Sea, the corals grow right to the surface. So it's easy to do under over shots or split level shots in the Red Sea of corals and above the surface. But unfortunately, the Red, or in the Red Sea, the sky doesn't have any clouds in it because it's a desert. So if you do under overs during the day, you just end up with a lovely coral reef yeah. and then just blue. <laughs> uh, and it's just not, not very interesting. So what we tend to do in the Red Sea is we wait until sunset to shoot a split level shot. And then at sunset, suddenly your sky is not boring blue. You've got lovely oranges and yellows and reds in your sky. And, and then you can do your reef um, and that. I, I think I put a picture in actually of the Red Sea split level. I don't know if you can put it up easily. Don't worry yeah. if you can't. Um, but, um, but yeah, so and then just to finish on the technical side, the technical side of split levels is also really, really important. So it's easy to take a split level photo where half of the picture is in focus. However, if you've decided to show someone a picture of two worlds, you should really be trying to, nine times out of ten, have both of them in focus. And that's actually where split level photography comes hard. So the, the, the way we achieve that as underwater photographers is we always focus on the underwater bit, and then we use a small aperture to keep the above water part sharp. Um, so you have to close the aperture right down. So you focus underwater because of the way that underwater optics works, so I'm not gonna bore you with that. You focus on your underwater subject, lock your focus off, and then shut your aperture right down. I shoot with full frame cameras, all three of these are full frame cameras. Um, and that means I have to shoot at f20 or f22 if I want everything to be sharp. If I'm shooting with a crop sensor SLR or a mirrorless camera, about f16 is okay and you'll get everything sharp. If you don't use those apertures, 
you won't get really good sharpness above and below the surface. Yeah. The yeah. problem of, 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 is that it's more difficult to work at those very small apertures because you need, in this case, lots of strobe light or lots of ambient light to do it. So you then make, you make it harder for yourself, but that's the way you, you get everything sharp. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Did we, do we see the one photo? I don't know. Is that the Red Sea? It looks more like the Cayman Islands. Yeah, that's the Cayman Islands. Cayman. But it's the same technique of flash. That was taken on a very stormy morning here. And we had these really, the, the, the storm clouds were completely purple. Um, and just for about five minutes, we just had these amazing purple clouds of dawn um, and just managed to grab a few photos um, of the stingrays against them. So this is flash lit underwater, focus underwater, aperture closed down, and then the shutter speed is adjusted to expose for the sky. Do we have another one? Ooh. Hmm. Look at that. This is the Red Sea picture from last. Both those pictures from last summer, but yeah, this is in the Red Sea, um, and that shows the the technique. So, flash lit underwater at, at sunset. And I've chosen to shoot this at sunset because, um, it, you know, you've got all those interesting colours coming into the sky. And another variation of that. I guess that's the same location. I don't. It's, it's actually just around the corner. This is Rassam Sid, and the other one is is just around the headland into. Um, I forget the name of the the dive site there. Um, just around, but it's, this is a this is a Rassam Sid jetty, um, and the other one is just around the corner. How do you deal with how do you deal with the water spots on the um, on the glass? So, what we on this trip? So the best thing is to try and keep it as dry as possible. And for example, with the stingrays, because at the, the, the sandbar in Cayman, you can you, you're actually not allowed to wear fins, and you have to stand on the seabed. You're not actually allowed to wear fins or boots there. It's just the, the rules they have. So when we go there, we actually stand up when you're standing in the water. So you actually get in the water, hold your camera above your head, and then when you're ready to shoot, try to keep the top of the dome as dry as possible. In the Red Sea, where you're swimming to take those pictures, and obviously you're not going to stand on the reef to take them, so here you're swimming, and it's much harder to keep the dome dry. So what we want to do here is a, I, I like to use a potato on a, on a liverboard or in a dive resort. It's easy to go and ask for a, a potato. Cut it in half, and I rub the top of my dome port with the potato before the dive then just give it a quick wipe off. And for about 40 minutes or so, it's very good at getting stopping droplets. And then the longer you're in, the, the more times you get it wet, and the longer you're in the water, the less it works. Saliva works as well, but once you're in the water and your saliva tends to get a bit more watered down, it doesn't work as well. So do it before you go in. Um, but the potato is nice. And I've actually got a photo of me rubbing the potato on the dome. To, to, um, on the night, I took those pictures, which I now use in my, my, my talks or my workshop. <coughs> People I really use. And both of those red sea shots were done with the aid of a potato. Amazing. A potato. We should potato, be carrying yes, more sorry. Potato. I was thinking because I say potato. So, yeah, cool. potato. Jill is asking what is the recommended setup, shutter speed, aperture, stroke position, for nailing close focus wide angle? I saw a lot of great images, sharp, perfectly lit, but I don't seem to be able to do it myself. Okay, so um, aperture for close focus wide angle is determined a little bit by your camera system. So on a full frame camera, if you can shoot at f13, you can guarantee that everything is going to be sharp in the picture. If you open the camera, the aperture more than f13, your corners will start to go slightly soft and also your background won't be that sharp. So for me, I try to be f13, f14, maybe f16. Um, if I was shooting with a, a camera with a smaller sensor, I can use a slightly wider aperture. So on a crop sensor SLR, like a D500 or a, a Canon 7D, you could open your aperture up and maybe shoot F8, F10 for those same shots. With a micro four third mirrorless camera, you could be on F8 and for, for those. Um, and that's something I tend to set before I go in the water. The shutter speed, um, I'm adjusting the shutter speed to get that background exposure right. So that's varying a lot. And I'll choose an ISO that gives me a good working range. I tend to have jump settings on my camera when working in the tropics of ISO 320, aperture F13, shutter speed 1 100. And for tropical diving, that's pretty good jumping in the water settings. But as soon as I'm down there, I'm going to be changing those settings a little bit to get everything right. And then it's about getting the real challenge of close focus light, wide angle is lighting that foreground subject well and lighting it evenly. Um, and I think that, that's the real challenge. The first thing is you need your strobes in nice and tight. 
if you go back to that anemone fish picture, um, which was on the screen a minute, I, you know, after that picture, I had my strobes top and bottom uh, of the camera. Um, but the strobe, I actually was using exactly this camera here, this lens and everything. Uh, um, so I had one strobe at the top here doing, sorry, I just realized, I was actually using this camera and this lens. I had one strobe at the top like that doing this, and one strobe at the bottom like this. Sometimes I might move the bottom strobe around to the side, but usually I'll just leave it at the bottom and turn the power way down. So the top strobe is doing 80, 90% of the work. The bottom strobe is just helping fill those shadows. Um, and that way you get a nice even illumination. So you can see that the light is coming down a little bit on top of this anemone with just a bit of fill from the bottom. And then I, I saw this was a good opportunity. I had a good background, a very nice foreground. And then I just spent some time with it until the fish lined up the way I wanted it to. And then I was able to produce the picture. That was um, taken in Missoula in Raja Ampat in this yeah, time yeah. last Yeah, you know, you make it sound <laughs> pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just waited until the fish lined up and, you know. Uh, <laughs> I think we have another they, one. Uh, you know, I, before everyone, you know, they don't always line up, but <laughs> I, I personally don't eat fish, and I, I think it helps. So they, they like oh, it. OK. <laughs> <coughs> and so yeah, this is another wide angle shot in Raja Ampat. This one was taken in November. Um, so the, um, here, it was, it was more about the background. So a lot of the time when shooting close focus wide angle or wide angle pictures, I was saying before, if you don't have that good background, you don't have an interesting shot. And on this morning, we had a lovely island going up into the sky. It was nice blue sky. And we had all these bait fish up at the surface. And I was just looking for any subject I could find on the reef to use as a foreground. So here, I wasn't the previous shot. I saw the anemone and then tried to build a picture around it. This shot here, I saw the background and was just swimming around underneath it, looking for any foreground that I could find um, and found this nice... Um, elephant ear sponge and this um, Elisella coral growing. And that, for me, you know, was a good foreground. And I tried several different foregrounds. Here I'm shooting quite vertically upwards to get that curve of Snell's window, um, the, the surface of the ocean, into the background that I think adds a strong graphic element to the background. And again, just strobes in nice and close, because although the scene is big, the area that I'm lighting is actually relatively small. So strobes, strobes top and bottom, and shot up, and again, shot, shot with that camera. I just realized that we're already 40 minutes in. Oh, so I'm, I'm, um, my <laughs> workshop doesn't start until 7 p.m. Yeah, taking time. But we, have yeah, another we, we have another five minutes. I think we, um, yeah, I, I don't want to skip any of the photos, but I think we go straight to another question. Ori is asking, my struggle with macro photography is that often there is a bit of seagrass or coral slightly in the front of the subject that I'm trying to take a photo of, and the camera keeps focusing on that instead of what I want to shoot. What kind of focus settings are best for these situations? Okay, so as I said earlier, um, underwater photography is a technical discipline, and it's um, it require, and some cameras are technically more able than others. And I don't want the answer to be spend more money with the camera shops, but sometimes it's a little bit like that. So first of all, with macro photography, you want to use a, generally, nine times out of 10, use a single point focusing. So you, rather than have your whole sensor trying to focus on the subject, you restrict the focus to one point on that sensor, and then you can place that over the subject, to make things right. Um, so that, that's the, the best thing. Um, if your camera has the ability to switch from autofocus to manual focus, that can also be a good, good solution. So sometimes we do that by just having a switch on the camera. Sometimes you can just change the focus mode from autofocus to manual focus. Sometimes people prefer to have the focus for macro set on a button that falls underneath your thumb. Um, all these housings have it set up like that. So um, I'll, I'll spin this one around so you can have a look at this one. Um, so to focus on this one, you can turn the focus off so it's no longer on the shutter. You can do that through the menu of the camera and have the focus so it's on this button here, which is called, on, on Nikon speak, it's called AF on. On other cameras, it's not always called that. Um, and that falls underneath your thumb. That way you can focus on your fish. The bit of coral comes in the way and then you can just make the final adjustments by rocking the camera in and out. Now, you don't rock the camera in and out necessarily by swimming when you're doing high magnification macro. Now, the seahorse shot that came up, that was quite a big seahorse, so that was easy to, to do that way. And that was actually shot with a manual focus lens. 
um, but, it, but it doesn't doesn't matter particularly. Um, what I normally do when I'm trying to shoot with the camera is if I am doing super macro, I'm looking to steady myself by placing a couple of fingers down on, on a rock or a, a, an area where there's no, no marine life growing to steady myself. I don't need to rest my arm on the seabed. I don't need to rest my knees on the seabed to take a picture, but I'm gonna look for a place where I can put my two fingers down um, to steady myself. And what I'll do is if I'm gonna photograph, obviously my camera is in my right hand, I'm looking for a place to hold on that's not with my left hand, but I'm actually going to look for something on the right side of my subject. So I'll spot my subject, I'll pretend I'm going to photograph the, the camera up there, and I'll, I'll reach across with my, my hand, sorry, let's get the pen down a bit, and grab something on this side. That way I can use my forearm to rest the camera on. So I'm holding on with these two fingers here, rest my camera there, and then I've got a very stable base to be able to rock in and out and make those fine, fine adjustments to my focus, and therefore I'm not stuck on having my focus exactly where, where it is. But the key things for focusing on macro is use that single point and have that single point over the subject. If that's not possible, switch over to a manual focus, either mechanically or by using a thumb focus or however you like to do it, and then do the final adjustment by rocking in and out. But if you can get that forearm across, it gives you that really stable base to be able to rock in and out. I've got an invisible camera now but you know, you see what I'm doing. And then you can get that very precise focus. And then you can also have your subject away from the center of the frame where that single point focuses and create maybe a more interesting composition. That's a great advice. It's a lot Thanks to take a lot. In. I mean, we, we're coming close uh, to the end of our time slot, but uh, there is a, another one. Tony, can you show this one? Wow. I don't just want to skip over it. I want to at least just look at it for a second. And then, are you ready for the final question yes, that course. we have to do? OK, this is um, from Joy. When using strobes in macro photography, how can you ensure that marine life isn't negatively affected by the sudden flashes of light? Is there any scientific evidence of how this affects animals? Um, so I think there's a few things to say about this. Um, is first of all, I think it's the right attitude of photographers to ask these questions to think uh, about these things. Um, there's been one big scientific study on this, um, and the scientific study basically has shown that there's no strong effects of, of flash in the, in the marine environment of doing this. However, um, touching subjects has a huge impact. It's kind of their message. So, you know, if, if people, however, I would always say to photographers, Think about what you're doing. If you're going to photograph a subject that clearly lives in one place, you know, it's a fish that lives in a burrow or a seahorse that doesn't move very fast. Think about what you're doing. If you're photographing a parrotfish that swims across the reef and it's on the move all the time and you take a few photos, it's going to carry on swimming and it's, you know, if it doesn't want to be near you, it's going to swim away. Um, but I think with these gobies or, or, or the, the goby in the other picture, whenever you are working with a subject that is clearly living in that place, you need to show some restraint. Um, just because I think it's, it, it's sensitive. However, the scientific evidence says that flash photography really doesn't have a big effect on animals. However, I think, particularly if we're diving in places where there's lots of photographers, we should always have a little bit of sense. So things that I do, for example, if I photograph pygmy seahorses, which are, are known to be sensitive to those things, um, is I won't do all my setting up shots on the seahorses. I'll go to a nearby sea fan maybe while I'm queuing up behind another photographer, and do a couple of test shots there. Um, so I, I know that when I get to the subject, I'm, I'm going to wait. And actually, with pygmy seahorses, the key to getting great photos of pygmy seahorses is not to use a focus light, because they don't like it, they'll turn away. Um, and it's actually just to sit there and wait, and wait for them to get relaxed with you, and wait for them to, to sit there relaxed, and, and they'll, they'll sit out and watch you. Um, and then you can take your shots. You don't get great photos of them by just hammering away, going click, 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 click. One of these is going to be great. You get much better pictures by sitting there quietly, waiting for the subject to get interested in you, be relaxed, and then just taking one or two shots of the good things, having got your exposure right on, on an area away from the subject. Um, that said, the scientific evidence actually says that's not a problem. Um, but it's very good that we ask those questions. I think what we need to be much more careful about is being hands-on with subjects, being knees and fins on with coral reefs. These have a much bigger impact on the environment that the animals are living in. And it's something that I try and impress on people on my workshops, 
is I want groups of photographers to travel, you know, to be known for going to resorts, taking amazing photos, and the resort afterwards being able to say to other guests, we have this group of photographers here, they tried their best all week, they made amazing pictures, everyone was staying off the reef, everyone wasn't hassling critters, everyone was still getting great pictures. Don't look at these amazing pictures out there and go, oh, that must be poked into position or set up. You know, you don't get nice behavior shots by hassling animals. You don't get subjects sitting there looking relaxed, looking straight at the camera, hassling, hassling you know, by hassling animals. Um, and I think those, those are the important things that we should focus on as photographers. I think it's a very interesting uh, and the right closing topic that we have here. I mean, you know, we can keep talking for like hours. We yeah. still have a lot of material. We have yeah. a lot of questions still, but we are limited a little bit in time and we have to come to an end now. Alex, thanks a lot. It was really a pleasure. I think Thank everybody here much. really enjoyed listening to what you uh, had to say. Um, I hope you're going to have an amazing time in the Cayman Islands. I know you just arrived this morning, so get that jet lag under control and make the people happy. And um, thanks a lot. Um, no, you're for, welcome. It was really a pleasure. And um, for us here, we uh, finish this live stream in a second, and then we have Laurent Ballesta on the stage at 3:30, talking about his one of his latest uh, projects, 700 Sharks into the Dark. You can see already the exhibition over there, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be worth taking a look later on. Alex, that was amazing. Take care, man. <laughs> Thanks a lot. My best to everyone there. Thank you very much. Bye.